I can just about buy the idea that over many billions of years, life went from, oh, I accidentally made a bubble, to, hey, I made a bubble and it kind of does something useful, I'm going to call it a cell, to now my bubble makes more copies of itself to produce infinite bubbles, though that last one, I'll admit, is still kind of a mind blower. The leap that always took it over the edge, though, was why do these cells start teaming up to form multicellular organisms? Yes, at the fully finished version, we are kind of useful, but in the beginning, beginning, why does a cell give up the functionality that it took 2 billion years to evolve, its freedom of movement, and as a result, the requirement to now recruit even more resources to keep itself alive, to be stuck back to back with another member of its family? Isn't that surely a less survivable species rather than a more survivable one? We can make cells from scratch in the lab reasonably easily, we call them protocells. Some of the components of that cell, things like the cell membrane, actually self-assemble for a spontaneous Simultaneously, making the process a little bit easier, but the jump to many-celled life that can then reproduce a perfect copy of itself, this jump is so difficult to coerce that scientists have been able to conclude possibly when it happened in history, but have never been able to recreate even elementary parts of that process. That is, until now. A research team based at Georgia Tech have over the past year recreated one leap to multicellular life and shown a path of evolution, and that is the story that I want to talk about today. But first, I need to introduce today's sponsor, AG1. AG1 is a nutritional supplement that I've been drinking for the past three months or so every single morning on an empty stomach, usually immediately before or after a gym session. I lead a reasonably hectic life at the moment and I like AG1 as a quick way to top up on high quality vitamins and nutrients from whole foods. It also has pre and probiotics that support gut microbiome. I also like baking it into my routine because it gives me a set point in the day that rather than reaching maybe for a less healthy substitute, I feel like I'm doing something to support my overall overall health and taking it off first thing in the day. AG1 uses the purest sources of ingredients. It tests rigorously against 950 common contaminants and impurities, so every batch is delivered to the gold standard for those who must follow either strict rules regarding the use of supplements and ensures that you are getting exactly what is on the label. AG1 are running a great offer at the moment. Head to my link in the description down below to get a free one year supply of AG Vitamin D3 plus K2 plus five AG1 travel packs with your first purchase of AG1. Thank you to AG1 for keeping science education free on the internet. Now, into the video. Okay, let's start with the basics. Evolution requires three things. One, that you can have random changes to an organism. We call this variation. Two, that that organism can then pass its makeup onto its offspring, which we call heredity, usually in the form of genes. And three, that the adaptations that make those offspring the most effective survivors and procreators will most favorably represented in the species going forward. This is called natural selection, or you might have otherwise heard it as survival of the fittest. There has been a lot of talk recently about a missing fourth component, something that explains why again and again nature evolves complexity out of otherwise very simple starting systems. I did a video on this which you can find wherever I left a link where I talked to Lee Cronin who has proposed one of the most compelling approaches to closing this gap. But the point remains. Nature seems to be following a set of underlying patterns. Much like its desire to make everything turn into a crab, a process called carcinization, coined in the 1916s, which is an idea that if you wait long enough, basically everything becomes crabs. Similarly, when we look at common genes found across organisms that we study, multicellularity looks to have evolved independently at least 25 times. For large complex creatures, there have been three such big leaps. One of these big transitions led us all ultimately to producing plants, and if you look at one of the other transitions in the tree, you can see just how close animals and fungi pop up surprisingly similar and close together. For animals, obviously multicellular creatures take the form of mammals that we are familiar with, to truly bizarre creatures such as colonial organisms, which sound ultimately like they go off and invade other countries, they don't. They are composed of many individual but connected interdependent individuals, such as corals or more surprisingly maybe the Portuguese 
Man of War, which I always think is amazing. Something as sophisticated as the Portuguese Man of War looks like a single animal, it is actually a collection of independent organisms cooperating to give it the form and function. And the big question on many scientists and many people around the world's mind was, well, how does this actually happen? We can prove that it does happen time and time again, but because soft early microscopic organisms don't preserve well, we have some level of fossil record, but really not much, it's very difficult to work out the steps that happened to unlock this possibility. This was the headspace of Dr. William Ratcliffe and his team at Georgia Tech. They wanted to run an experiment where they could encourage the jump from single-celled behavior to multi-celled behavior to potentially unlock some of the mystery that showcased how this path might have been followed. They wanted to understand that if by putting in place the right pressures, could they force this organism to evolve multicellularity? The system that the team decided to ultimately study was yeast, a eukaryotic, meaning a cell containing a nucleus single-celled microorganism classified as a member of the fungus kingdom. The very first yeasts originated hundreds of millions of years ago, and today we know of at least 1,500 species that are currently recognized. Humans have been using yeast for thousands of years to make things like bread and beers, and brewer's yeast, or Saccharomyces cerevisiae, from the Latinized Greek meaning sugar fungus, is capable of converting sugars and starches into alcohols and carbon dioxide. What a wonderful creature. And it has become one of the most heavily studied model organisms in all of cell biology for its factory-like ability to produce strange compounds. We are very good as a result of modifying these abilities to make other things that are kind of useful to us. We currently use yeast to provide half of the world's global supply of insulin for diabetics that require it, and researchers at Stanford University have also demonstrated that yeast can synthesize opioids directly from sugars because California. But this is a 20-step chemical process that is so complicated, it shows the incredible sophistication of these single-celled organisms. It was when Ratcliffe observed that some of these yeast cells had a natural tendency to get stuck together and separate from the rest of the batch as they were suspended in liquid, and they would sink to the bottom of their container, giving Ratcliffe the idea that maybe this could be a prime candidate for evolution into multicellular version of yeast. The actual mechanics of the experiment that he ultimately decided to run were in fact pretty straightforward. Ratcliffe agitated containers of yeast cells suspended in water for 24 hours at a time in a sugar environment so that the yeast could grow and reproduce. He would then lightly centrifuge the tube, which pushes any of the heavy material down to the bottom of the tube and lighter material as a consequence kind of gets stacked higher up. As a result, the yeast cells that had formed a cluster would be at the bottom of the container, which he could then extract with a pipette and would use to grow the next yeast colony. His underlying reasoning was that their ability to stick together was probably genetic, so inheritable by their offspring. By repeating this process over and over again and using the extracted clumped yeast cells as parents of the next generation, he would slowly create a strain of yeast that preferred to cluster together, driven in this direction because of the process of his selection. In this case, you could argue that this is an unnatural selection, but it could be happening naturally by an analogous process, say a predator in the environment that could only consume smaller organisms, like these rotifers. There's a fun demonstrator of this that Ratcliffe came up with, that by labeling clustered cells with blue pigment and single cells with red pigment, he could see which made up the majority of the rotifer's diet. Clearly here, mostly red, single-celled yeast, as the larger clusters are too big for it to consume. Regardless of whether it was Ratcliffe's unnatural selection or a more natural selection force, this might be one of those precursor steps before the jump ultimately to multicellular life. After just 60 days of running his experiment, Ratcliffe began to observe that his yeast had strongly started to prefer to cluster together. And what is really interesting and that I didn't know when I started looking into this is that there are two reasons that this can happen. The first is that the yeast cells can evolve and present certain proteins on their surfaces that are really sticky and as a consequence bond them to other sticky cells in a process called flocculation. You have to be a little bit careful when you say that word. It turns out though that this isn't actually what was happening to Ratcliffe's yeast. His yeast began to hold on to their offspring, like slightly overbearing parents, and not let them go. 
You can see this if you fluorescently stain their cell walls. You see a buildup of scar tissue called a budding scar at the point that the parent cell produced the daughter. This produces an extra strong attachment point and ultimately a very long, elegant, fractal-like snowflake structure for this multicellular organism. The really cool part was that when the snowflakes reached a certain size, the long filaments would break and those arms as they floated off into the container would then continue to reproduce until ultimately again they produced another snowflake organism, meaning that these snowflake yeasts could replicate, at least at a very kind of rudimentary multicellular reproduction process. Ratcliffe realized though that this capability was also a bit of a flaw in the organism. The single bond that connected a chain of these cells in each arm of the structure would ultimately limit the overall size and complexity that these yeast structures could produce. Eventually, a bond would grow too loaded from the long mass of cells either side of it, and any disturbance would cause it to break off, producing a new cluster, but meaning that the organism would forever remain delicate. It was actually one of Ratcliffe's colleagues, Dr. Ozan Bozdag, that came up with a kind of paradoxical suggestion. Maybe they could strengthen the organisms by depriving them of some of the necessary resources that they needed to survive, something that sounds quite important, like oxygen. Most of us take our richly oxygen oxygenated world obviously for granted, but free oxygen was anything but plentiful during the first half of Earth's 4.5 billion year history and that may actually have been advantageous. Oxygen is really powerful in biology. It increases cellular growth because it allows the cell to derive a higher yield of energy from the processes of metabolism. It also allows cells to break down and consume more complex food sources. However, access to oxygen may actually be a bad thing for evolving into multicellular life, and that is because single cells are much more efficient at using oxygen than multicelled organisms, at least for those multicellular organisms that haven't yet evolved hearts, lungs, and other things to pump oxygen around their system. That is because single cells can absorb oxygen from across their entire surface area. A multi-celled organism has some or all of its cell attached to other cells around it, rather than to the oxygen-rich environment. This means that oxygen has to slowly diffuse across other cells to reach the innermost cells, slowing their growth. What I think is really interesting is that this is actually the exact problem that many scientists around the world are facing at the moment because they are trying to push towards building better cellular models for how we can test medicines. At the moment, the FDA is pushing us away from animal testing, totally rightfully so, but that means we'd need a different way to work out which drugs are safe to try on human beings. There are a few different approaches to this, but organoids are receiving a lot of attention at the moment. These are essentially clusters made from organ-specific cell tissues, things like heart or lung or liver or kidney. You might have heard news stories recently about brains in a petri dish. This is exactly that, small organoids. The problem problem that many of these researchers are having is that because there isn't yet within these tiny organs a proper circulatory system, the cells in the inside of the organoid sometimes die or don't behave as expected because the amount of oxygen that they have available just isn't sufficient. Anyway, all that is to say, Dr. Bozdag suggested maybe if we remove oxygen, it will force cells to use anaerobic respiration. And without the constraints of cells wanting to be directly in contact with an oxygen-rich solution, they may be happier at being buried deeper into a cellular structure, ultimately causing a stronger, thicker, and more robust organism to evolve. Bozdag started by producing a mutant yeast that could survive not needing oxygen for respiration. And then and he began a version of the agitation, centrifuge, and extraction experiment. For an entire year, Bozdag patiently and persistently repeated the entire experiment with microscopic yeast clusters, not seeing much progress, but tracking what small steps that there were, until finally progress started to be visible. He continued the experiment ultimately for a total of 600 days. By the end of the process, the yeast cells had grown to 20,000 times larger than their original starting structures. They were ultimately visible now to the naked eye, reaching about a millimeter in diameter. The yeast cells had also begun to lengthen and entangle with themselves to form a resistant structure comparable in strength and toughness to wood. 
And that is a really important step because this structural resilience is essential for further complexity to be able to evolve, as small, thin, delicate structures are more often destroyed than not before they can get much beyond those interesting, wispy, snowflake-looking clusters. For me, though, the most impressive bit of this story is that in such a short time period, the cells in these new yeast organisms started to have specialized capabilities that they wouldn't otherwise have evolved if they were just single-celled organisms. That process of cellular differentiation is arguably the single greatest benefit available to multicellular organisms. Different cells now have different roles and goals. Some of the cells within the organism started to specialize to enable the entangling behavior behavior that increased the robustness of the overall organism, and counterintuitively, Ratcliffe found that some cells would actually spontaneously die, potentially as a mechanism to force arms that were otherwise very strong to break off, float away, so that the process of growing into another organism could start again, a simple form of reproduction. And honestly, the most absolutely amazing bit to me, to make sure that no cell in the organism was undernourished, the clusters had started to evolve early mechanisms to pump nutrients across all of their internal cells and ultimately to remove waste products from those cells, an early version of a circulatory system. And so against the backdrop of an expansive history of evolution on this planet, there was sitting in front of them true emergent complex life, all from a little agitation and external pressure. If you enjoyed this video, leave a like and maybe check out one of the other videos that I've done maybe on complexity and how it arises in evolution. I'll leave a link wherever I leave a link, probably down in the description. Until that point, thank you very much for watching. I'll see you guys next time. Goodbye.